the revolution will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised. The revolution will be no rerun, brothers. The revolution will be live. I come out of American liberalism. Uh, I'm a Wisconsin progressive. I'm from Wisconsin. I ran House and Senate staff during the 1960s. So though some of you environmentalists know the name Gaylord Nelson, the founder of Earth Day, I was his legislative director. And I did policy planning at the highest level of the State Department on UN matters. Straight, liberal, progressive career on the inside. Uh, I've been there, know that, done that. And I honor that tradition. And I think it is a tradition that needs now to be transcended and built alongside of and advanced to the systemic question. This period of American history possibly may be the most important period of American history, bar none. I'm concluding the American Revolution. And the reason I say that is I think there are reasons to believe that the current system is coming to a place where it has exhausted most of the major alternatives it can handle. That doesn't mean it will collapse in my opinion. It means that we are in an era where slow decay and increasing pain at many different levels is occurring decade by decade by decade. So that, for instance, income distribution over the last 30 years, we're talking about trends, not moments, has gotten worse. The top 1% had about 10% of the income and now has gone up in the 20% range, goes to 22 to 18. <coughs> meaning that the bottom 99% lost that huge chunk of income. Many economists believe that most of the gains in the entire economy were taken by the top 1%. I'm not particularly interested, though we can have that conversation on how outrageous that is. What I'd like you to think about is that things that create long, deep, ongoing, non-changing trends tell you there is a systemic problem deep in the structure of the system, not simply a political problem. Not simply a political problem. I come out of democratic politics. You can find similar trends for you ecologists, what's going on in global warming, but also in most of the great gains of the 70s, the trends are now decaying on wetlands, on use of land, on suburban expansion, et cetera, et cetera. Many changes, even the auto standards have increased, improved, but the mileage has gone more so that we're losing even on that front when you look at the trend data. If you look at liberty, the legal changes that have gone on, the loss of civil liberties, there are probably lawyers in the crowd here can tell you more about this than I can, but the decay by virtually all civil libertarians is a long decay, not a momentary decay. If you want to talk about liberty, the question is real loss of liberty and the trends here in the United States, we have seven times as many people per capita in prison, largely black and brown, than most other countries, including Russia. And the trend has been an increasing trend over time that has somehow denied people liberty. And democracy, the change in money, the loss of capacity to build progressive organizations, the Citizens United decision, the vast sums that tell you there is a process undermining traditional democratic processes at large. I want you to just think about that. Equa inequality, liberty, ecology, democracy. Those are the fundamental values at the heart of the American system. And the trend line, give or take a wobble, is in decay. Now, if that continues, and I think there are reasons to believe it is likely to continue, you're entering an era where, and I think we're well into this, that cannot be denied and people sense it. Something is wrong. Something ain't working. Something painful is going on. One of the processes when the major values of a system, liberty, democracy, equality, ec ecological sustainability, if we had time we could go into all of that, 
when they begin to decay, they are the legitimating values that give meaning and support to the system. And if they no longer legitimate, this is not a democratic system. This is not a system that produces liberty. This is, people begin to ask deeper and deeper questions. I think we're into that period of history, and I could go on in a longer discussion of why I think there are not going to be easy solutions, one of the most important of which, and it's really worth thinking about, is that the way the American corporate capitalist system has been designed, as in most of Western Europe, though on a more minor scale, to oversimplify slightly, is that the corporations and the elites get to own the capital. You define systems by who owns the property. Feudalism, it was land, and the people who had it controlled. The 19th century small business, and the people who had it produced kind of a capitalist, a real capitalist system. Corporate capitalism is what we've had with a balancing force called politics enforced by an institution. Here's the hard part, the really important part. That institution throughout the Western world was a labor union. That's what gave muscle to liberal politics. That's what kept the system sort of in line. It gave a base to politics. In many studies in political science, the correlation between the size of labor mo movements and outcomes in social, dem social, economic, and other factors are pretty well highly correlated. Labor has gone from 35% of the labor force as members at its peak, 35.4 in 1953. It is now down to about 11% total under 7% in the private sector, and declining. That defines a system crisis for the name of the system that is structured by corporate ownership and balanced sort of by liberal politics, enforced by the institution called the labor union. And that's ending. That's ending. It is a very big deal, in my opinion. I, I won't have time to go into why I think we're entering a period of economic stagnation, but part of it has to do with the loss of income at the bottom levels that do not supply enough demand, traditional Keynesian analysis, to sustain a high growth path. Part of it has to do with globalization, and part of it has to do with the incapacity of the stalemated political system to actually make decisions, something conventional, but not realized that part and parcel of that is the loss of the power base of traditional reform movements called the labor union. Now, that's a pretty heavy rap. That's a dark picture. What I think is interesting about our systemic crisis, and it is a systemic crisis, that ownership structure is what it is and is no longer being balanced, in my opinion. By the way, concentration of ownership is probably worth mentioning. You probably all know these figures. The top 1% has more capital ownership than the bottom 95% taken together. The top 400 people, top 400 individual persons in this society of 318 million, 400 individuals have more capital than the bottom 180 million taken together. It is a medieval structure of ownership. I don't mean that rhetorically. It is so extreme that it can be called medieval. That's the way medieval society was organized in terms of land ownership. And the patterns we're seeing come from that problem. Now, people on the left, particularly the Marxist tradition, have gone to look at those kinds of figures and analyses and suggest that a collapse will happen and a revolution will happen. I don't think so. I think we're in an extremely unusual period of history. I think it is a period where there is sufficient blocking power left in the system and sufficient scale of government so that the system doesn't collapse. It may not succeed, but let me tell you why. In 1929, all of government taken together, the floor that held up the economy when everything else went bad was 11% of the economy in 1929. It's now of the order of 32 to 34 percent, depending upon what the GDP denominator is. So there is a floor that prevents, in my opinion, a full collapse. And besides, even the conservatives become Keynesians when things go bad. 
George Bush's wonderful comment, this sucker could go down, unquote, and we better do something about it. So what happens if a system neither succeeds nor collapses? Neither succeeds nor collapses and slowly becomes delegitimated because the values it affirms are denied by the practices it engenders. Over time, I had dinner with Carlos tonight and I said, what's your 35 year plan? I'm talking to the person in your seat. You're interested in this stuff? You want to play this game? The chips are decades of your life. So we may be entering a period, in my opinion, in which ongoing stagnation, give or take an uplip, social and economic decay, loss of liberties, and a long, long process of delegitimation and growing economic problems. Very unusual. Very unusual. Doesn't collapse. But it doesn't reform. Doesn't collapse. Doesn't reform. Odd, odd context. So the question becomes for people who want to change the system is in an emerging historical context of that kind. Let me reiterate that phrase. You want strategy? You better have a sense of what the emerging historical context might permit, allow, or generate. I think the emerging historical context is one in which more and more people are slowly beginning to realize something is really wrong, <coughs> including people on the right crazy liberty Tea Party people who for some reason are worried about liberty, leave aside the nuttiness. There is a concern about the system and liberty it, that is real and something's wrong about even the traditional American individualism. I don't buy their politics, but I do see them as a signal again of loss on this front and to be paid attention to as a systemic indicator rather than as an argument about politics. That kind of process I think is going forward and it cannot be answered except by the development, if it is a systemic crisis, as I would argue if we had more time at length, it is, a highly unusual kind, not the crisis collapse form, blah, blah. then it, if it is a systemic crisis, it can only be answered by a systemic response. By definition. By definition. I am for doing whatever we can do on the reform front. I'm for electing Obama and I'm for getting liberals in office, yes and the trends are likely to continue to decay. We've got to prevent the worst and get whatever advances we can get and we'll get some. But if it is a systemic crisis, you're talking about how the structure of ownership of the basic power of the system is organized, which poses two radical questions. Radical intellectually first, radical politically in a different sense. If you don't like capitalism and you don't like state socialism, what do you want? And if you don't know, why should we talk to you about systemic change? Heavy question. Progressives have not addressed that question. They have waved flags at it and talked rhetorically about change the system. And they have not asked, answered honest questions posed often by liberals as well as conservatives, if you don't like corporate capitalism and the old balancing act that is decaying, if we could do a Sweden, that wouldn't be so bad, but you'd have to have an 80% labor force and it having problems also in Sweden. That was the old model we liberals used to think would be a Sweden. That's over it, and it's decaying in Sweden. But if you don't, and you don't like state socialism, because the conservatives were right about this, by the way, State socialism con concentrates power in a way that undermines liberty and democracy. I'm from the left, but they were right and the left didn't pay attention. Then what do you want? I'm not talking about what I want, I'm talking about the person in your chair. Have you thought about it? 
Have we thought about it? Have we actually begun to struggle with the question, if you don't like capitalism, you don't like socialism, what do you want? I think in the emerging context that we are entering, that question is our question. And I think it begins with the problem of who owns the capital. It doesn't end there. But it begins with the question of, is there a way to consider transforming the ownership of the power base of the institutions, many forms, but above all, who owns property and wealth? And it cannot be that you can have a democratic system in which 400 people own more wealth than the bottom 185 million. Where are you going to put the capital in your system? It's an odd question for those of you who want to play this game and want to throw some chips on the table. There aren't many places, you, you know, four or five different places. You can put it in the state, that's called state socialism. You might put it in worker ownership. I'm, for, I favor worker ownership and I don't think it answers all the problems. You might put it in cities. Municipalization is another form of socializing capital. Some cities do a lot with it, by the way. There's some cities that have very interesting ownership of land, municipalities, own, social, own energy. 25% of American energy is socialized, by the way, municipal and cooperative ownership. You might put it in co-ops. You might put it in small business. Or you might begin, you might put it in a regional structure of public ownership. I'm just throwing some possibilities on the table. The Tennessee Valley Authority, in its original design, was a vision of regional control of ownership of large-scale industry and an ecological control of a river that was, out, that was out of control as well. It was an ecological vision and they wanted to do seven of them in World War II, cut that apart. So it was a regional vision. I think if you begin looking at the problem that it becomes clear that if you want a democratic form of institution, you need to begin for one thing. You need to begin at the bottom and build a democratic culture and a democratic experience and democratic ownership forms so that the people in our system actually have experience of being democratic owners. Otherwise, it ain't gonna work democratically. So I take very seriously, much more seriously maybe than some of you, developments all over this country that are beginning to experiment with worker ownership. That is to say, there are thousands of them being developed and experimented with. There are already 10 million people involved one or another, one or another form of worker ownership, mainly the ESOP form, Employee Stock Ownership Plan, but within that there's a democratizing form. I think the, I think the left and progressives needed to take the ESOPs much more seriously than they have. There have been some problems with unions and some of them have gone rotten, but some places around the country, I can give you citations, they're unionizing, they're taking over, they're participating, they're changing ownership, they're changing control, because that's where the real ownership is now, so far. Ten million people, three, three and a half million more than our members of unions in the private sector are in worker-owned companies of that kind. But the democratizing edge is the cooperative form. That's one element without which you cannot democratize the culture. So you want to play this game, in my opinion, one place to start is not seeing the worker ownership cooperative as simply an answer to problems of equity, though it is and can be, and not simply a good thing to do, though it is and can be, but maybe strategically. If the context is something like what I've suggested, I could give you a much longer, more academic discussion of this, I, I hope, and would bore you to stiff, but if the context is something like that, then the process over time of constructing a new culture based on small-scale rebuilding an actual experience of people is a critical ingredient. It is strategic, not tactical, and not token if you see it that way, and if you're willing to throw a few decades on the table don't have to do this. I'm just talking to the people who want to play. But that's one of the things you would probably do. It is by no means the only thing. There are much more interesting and sophisticated developments and experiments going on around the country right now out of this context of failure, pain, and nothing else is working, which is driving people to innovate 
We spend a lot of time in, at the, uh, the Democracy Collaborative following this. And by the way, a web page, community-wealth.org. Put the dash in because we report on all this stuff. There are really interesting things going out. Being driven by the failures and the pain and the dead end and there ain't no other answer. People are being forced to try things, both politically and economically. Some of you may know about the Evergreen Cooperatives in Cleveland. How many have heard that, heard about it? That's a, that's a project that our group is, it was instrumental in helping develop. Now here you get another step forward. Interesting step. The, the cooperatives there in Cleveland, and they're large scale, they're just about, they will open very shortly. The largest, by far, the largest greenhouse in any American, in any American city, partly solar, partly non-solar, to the extent they can do it solar in, in northern Ohio. Uh, three million heads of lettuce a year will be its production capacity, owned by the workers. There is a solar installation co-op about to put in more solar capacity in Ohio than, than exists in the entire state over the next few years. And there's a, one of the greenest and most efficient laundries, uses about a third of the water and heats about a third of the water, large-scale industrial launder, also worker ownership in Cleveland, part of the Evergreen Complex, and they're putting on two new companies a year. What's interesting here, and this is happening all over the country, if you, the press doesn't report it, they can't afford to report it, they're not interested, and they don't have the money and, taff and staff, but if you dig deeply, the Cleveland model is really interesting in two respects. It advances worker ownership, but it is also a community building strategy, not simply a worker ownership strategy. Let me say that again. It is a community building strategy, not simply a worker owned strategy. So for instance, there is a nonprofit community corporation that owns and controls, controls the voting stock. You can't leave if you're, if you're a worker owned company. You get financing from the center, but you put back a per share of your profits in order to start more companies and in order to put some profits into community building. It's a community structure. Worker-owned companies tend to get pretty greedy for themselves. They're not necessarily community builders. They can be. Some of them are culturally. But some of them become as, you know, there have been studies of this, as Republican worker owners as small businessmen mentalities. And they pollute when they need to because they compete. And they make money when they can. And they, they're not terribly interested in the community. So the structure of community becomes an important thing to experiment with. And the Cleveland model takes that forward one notch, in part based on the revolving funds that were developed in the Mondragon model. Some of you know about the Mondragon experience. We'll come back to Mondragon. Second element of the Cleveland model, which advances the systemic design problem. Listen, systemic design means that you've thought through something about the way the institutions function and how they might or might not produce outcomes. It ain't just, let's do one of them. What is it going to do? Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Really? Let's think about it. The second piece in the, in the Cleveland model, as you see, has got a community impact idea, not simply worker-owned companies in a, in a capitalist sea fighting with each other. That's an edge. Co-ops aren't all like that. The second piece of it, which is very interesting, you can, you can do that here in Austin. They are using quasi-publicly funded institutions of large scale, hospitals and universities, get a lot of Medicare, Medicaid, student, other public funds, in a poor area of Cleveland, 40,000 people, largely black, average family income less than 18,000. There's a big hospital, the Cleveland Clinic, there's Case Western Reserve University, there's a university hospital. They buy $3 billion of goods and services a year. Same thing in Austin, I'm sure. None of which came from that neighborhood. Much of which could come from that neighborhood. And now with this model partly is being purchased from these worker co-ops. Think about that as a slightly different design that people are experimenting with. That's a quasi-public planning structure using a quasi-public market to help stabilize worker-owned firms in a community building design. 
You don't like capitalism, you don't like socialism, what the hell do you want? Well, here's one mini answer in Cleveland. And by the way, in Atlanta, they're developing the same thing, and now they're developing in Pittsburgh. They're even exper experimenting here in Texas in Amarillo, by the way. Odd place, but they are. And many other cities have begun looking at the Cleveland model because it takes worker ownership and cooperative in a way that is neither state ownership nor fragmentary, nor simply worker co-ops, though it is built on those models and advances a design that aims at community and broader ecological and other concerns. The important point, if you wanted to take that large scale, we've done some studies on this. There's, one, there's a, a magazine for ecologists called Solutions. In the current issue, we have a long discussion of what I'll give you a short version now. <coughs> if we get to the point, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if we get to the point where we begin to build mass transit and high-speed rail, that will be all public money and commuter money. The United States has no capacity to build high-speed rail. We do assemble a little bit of it, made by foreign companies. There's a tiny little factory in Portland that's doing a little bit with streetcars, but by and large, no capacity. Yet, when we do it, we are going to build an entirely new industry with public money. That could just as well be focused in the design, large scale, like those hospitals, public purchases, industry in Detroit, and the same design. That's well within the same design capacities. I'm suggesting that the design problem is on the table. I think you could do more and more on this and some of the issues taken up in America beyond capitalism begin to touch the design question. I don't think the left or the right has even gotten its feet wet on the subject. And it is critical. It's critical for a couple reasons. One, it is a legitimate question raised by conservatives. Absolutely legitimate. Well, what about those socialist models? They weren't democratic and they weren't they didn't produce liberty and they didn't produce ecological sustainability. Is that what you want? And if you don't have an answer that you actually believe, why should they listen to you? So the design question is with us. And I see co-ops and worker-owned companies as part of it, and particularly culturally, but also pushing the design edge further and further. And because of the pain levels emerging in many parts of the country, I think that's happening all over the place because people have no traditional choice. So whether you want to play or not, lots of people are playing out of pain. They're forced to innovate. It's a very powerful thing going on in the country. There, I could, if you look at that website, you'll see you, there are land trusts, that ownership of land going on. There are many attempts to state, state banks. There are 20 states now considering doing it. The Bank of North Dakota, the Socialized Bank of North Dakota, 20 states have legislation pending. There are another 20 states that have single payer health care pending. There, that is bound to happen in this direction as well. Almost certainly single payer is going to come state by state by state because the cost problems are not solvable the other way. And because some of the big companies want to get that cost off their books so they can compete internationally, there's a pressure game that you're going to get 20% of the economy moving towards this sector. At bottom up, worker owned, worker group. And some sectors like healthcare, I think, have no alternative internally over time but to go this way because of the cost pressures. We could have a long discussion about that. In a no number of areas, several, you're getting different processes that begin to move in, in my opinion, towards a systemic design. Remember, I'm a historian and political economist. I think of these in developmental stages over time, over decades, not the next election only. The is really interesting things that are happening in communities, step by step, of the kind I described. A number of states, particularly in healthcare, particularly in banking, are moving and challenging forward in that direction, and I think will advance as the pain levels continue. Many cities are experimenting with city ownership of land. It used to be most cities, for instance, would invest in a, in a subway system or a mass transit system. Those of you who are economists know that at the exits of those systems, land values go up. They're very good commercial sites. Used to be you let the developers take those, and then you try to chase after them and tax back some of the money. Most cities now socialize the land. What? 
Most cities now socialize the land when they do a social public investment to recapture for public use the profits of this public investment. There are interesting trends in many, many cities that people are not aware of because it isn't covered in the press because most of the academic studies don't look at it from this perspective, particularly of time and of evolution in terms of pain levels. So there are very interesting things going on that are positive and hopeful and contribute elements possibly, possibly, towards a pluralistic vision of ownership of wealth. I sometimes use the term a pluralist commonwealth, plural forms of common ownership, co-ops, worker-owned, state, vocal, et cetera, and some national, that begin to shape out a design that might actually be democratic, might be sustainable, might be decentralized, and might actually be a different vision. Why do we have to be stuck with the two old visions? I just don't get it. There are not just two alternatives, and we can, <laughs> I talked with Carlos about this at dinner, we, I'm talking about you, the person in your chair, we can design the damn thing if we step up to it. I don't have time anymore for people who don't want to play the game. There's a systemic crisis, we can do this, or we can make a damn good shot at doing it. And if we don't, we've got nobody to blame but ourselves. So I'm interested in what's your design. And secondly, these processes of change can be advanced. They are popping up in many parts of the country. In my opinion, they can be advanced. And furthermore, there are some really interesting things going on nationally. Uh, did you notice we nationalized General Motors and Chrysler and the largest insurance company in the world? We did do that. Nationalization is not something we haven't done. We just did it. And then because the political movement had no vision and power yet, we gave it back after the profits started to roll in there will be a day potentially when that question can be asked in a different way. Whether or not there might be a way to use those larger institutions as well to build a plural vision in support of a very communi community-based cultural and worker-owned context. So I'm sketching for you very broadly. Uh, I'm not an optimist. I'm a historian and political economist. I think the press doesn't let you know any of this, or very little of it. I think what's going on around the country already suggests powerful and interesting solutions are being generated because there aren't alternatives in the traditional modality. And I think as time goes on, possibly, worth a shot, maybe, this can be advanced not to change the system yet. I think it is within the power of people like us. I'm going to say that carefully. I think it is within the power of people like us possibly to establish the prehistory of the next great transformation. I didn't say the revolution is tomorrow. I said that the prehistory, institution by institution, including ideas about how you're going to design it when they ask you why is that going to be good, including thinking it through. I think we have the possibility, if we, get, if we step up to the plate, of really getting a handle on that for the first time in history. We may not make it. Systems collapse, systems decay, violence occurs, terrorism occurs, fascism occurs. But by the way, did you notice those dictators in Latin America who controlled everything and tortured people? They're gone. So even if it is your vision that this will decay, decay into violence, repression on a corporate state or fascism, some people think that, the problem doesn't change. Look at Latin America and ask yourself about those heroic people. Even going to and through a major crisis, the same question emerges. What is it you want? Why would it be better, and how do we build it? So projects, strategies, systemic design, and vision. And vision takes you to a different level entirely. A systemic design is that institutional structure that you believe can enhance and inform and sustain and nurture 
the vision of equality, liberty, ecological sustainability, even community. So we all, the values and the vision are very common. Then the question down is how do we build the institutional substructure? So I'm saying to you kind of, you know, this odd, crazy idea that you, you and me, may live in the most interesting time in American history bar none. A simple way to do it, and this is highly oversimplified, but they ran the system in the 19th century very easily in one sense. They just kept taking over land and killing Native Americans until they got to the other coast and ran out of land. It was a very easy way to run an empire, and it was called the empire. It's called the Empire State because they were creating an they didn't have an ocean between the colonies. They had land. They took it all over. And if you look at the 20th century, less oversimplified but also true, in the first quarter of the century, the economy was in great decay, several major recessions and financial crises, building up to a deep recession in 1913, 1914, and World War I bailed out the economy. We don't know what would have happened had World War I not occurred, but it is a fact that World War I bailed out the economy. And then the decay began again in the 20s, particularly in agriculture, but throughout the, the system, building up to 1929. And then it collapsed again, and World War II bailed out the economy. And in the third quarter of the century, the economy was sustained by the leftovers of World War II, savings that were accumulated and sustained the economy in the post-war period. They were also sustained by investments made to rebuild the destroyed European nations, the Marshall Plan, et cetera, which boosted our economy. And also, it's easy to run an economy in the global economy when your enemies, when your former competitors have been destroyed. One of the results of World War II in the post-war quarter of a century, the third quarter, was that until they came back, we had a free reign in global markets. And also the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, and the expenditures there boosted up. I think we're running out of war. I don't say they did those, I don't believe those wars were done for that reason. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. It is a fact that that's how they worked. They sustained the economy. And military expenditure, which averaged 10% in the 1950s, hit 14% in the Korean War, went down to 8% in the 60s and 7% roughly in the 70s. It's now down in the 3 to 4% range and declining. That sustainer of the economy is decaying also. And unlikely that we will either go back to a war situation to bail us out, highly unlikely because of nuclear weapons. We're not going to have land wars anymore. 42% of the economy was spent in World War II and kept the economy boosting. And it seems like we're getting smaller wars to sustain the economy. People don't like them. And besides, we're a very big economy and you can spend a lot of money. Even a big defense budget is a small percent. So we're back again to this picture of stagnation, stalemate, and decay as the emerging historical context by just another route, posing the same question. How do we build for the long haul how do we begin with the institutional experimentation? How do we develop new alliances? How do we get together and begin to think about all this in a new way? How do we get out of, oh, it can't be done here, nothing's possible? How do you think change always occurs? It's not fancy. It's people like us, those kids who sat down in the civil rights movement, the peace war. You know, who else? So I'm a cautious optimist. It's why I love to come and hear what you all are doing and am pleased and honored to be invited because I think that's where the action is here, it's not in Washington. And uh, why I'm encouraged to say with you, let us carry forward and just get on with the job. Thank you very much. He was asking, he said, there's a large part of debt accumulating in the financial structure, huge amounts of debt and the dangers that this poses and couldn't we just get rid of all that? Is that roughly what you'd ask? Um, obviously, the, the current structure of the system, if you did that, would be very fragile. On the other hand, you can do a lot with housing. That's essentially what ought to be done in the housing market, essentially say the debt's over, or in many, many cases. And if those of you who are interested in this, there's a group of people who really been working on, so each, each one of these areas, there are people really working on very interesting stuff. Ellen Brown is a woman who's been working on public banking. 
I'm tempted to give you, I'll give you a short version of this because it's very interesting. You, you know, most people don't realize that money is created out of nothing. You know, the Federal Reserve Board waves a, waves a wand and creates money. That's how it's done. Where did you think it comes from? If there was just a little pot of money and the economy kept expanding, there's got to be new money that's created. The Federal Reserve Board can lend to the government. What it now does now, it buys bonds from the banks who then lend to the government and they make a big profit. So in some countries, in Canada, at certain points in history and many other countries have said, well, you know, the Federal Bank, the Federal Reserve Board ought to lend, this is where you get the solution, directly to the government and finance the deficits. That can be done. Uh, that is being done and has been done historically and, and the kinds of debts you're talking about could be wiped out in different ways. To go further is, would take us into what they call the weeds, right? And I just can't do it, but I'd be happy to talk with you after. Americans don't participate was the question. How do we deal with the fact that there's a cu culture of not participating? Well, sometimes there is such a culture. But I worked with steel workers in Youngstown, Ohio in 1977, the first big steel closing that went down. 5,000 people lost their job one day in September 1977. That was huge news in 1977 because it hadn't been happening. Now it happens every day, so it's not news. So one steel worker said, well, why don't we buy the plant? Why don't we take over the plant and run it, like what they did in Argentina? Only let's get some public money and so forth to do it. This is 1977 in America. And all of a sudden, there was a whole movement of guys who didn't want to participate. And they began, just like in Argentina, to start participating because they saw an opportunity. They got encouragement. They saw other people doing it, and they began to do it. Two pieces of the story. The Carter administration promised 100 or $200 million in loan guarantees to these guys because they organized the politics of the state. And Ohio is still important politically to Democrats and Republicans. So they had Ohio totally organized, and the religious community, and some of the steel workers. The Carter administration put the money on the table. After the election of 1978, the money disappeared. Why? Because the corporations, and it seems clear, the Steel Workers International didn't want it at that point. The Steel Workers International, I'm talking about this participation, they didn't want participation. Why? Because these young activists might challenge the leadership internationally. And they were quite willing to, no jobs, that's it. That's that story. 30 years of development in the state of Ohio, those people inspired the idea of worker ownership. You can find more worker-owned companies in the state of Ohio than you can shake a stick at because a lot of people were inspired. Cleveland has come out of that. This model I talked to you about in Cleveland came out of that cultural development over 30 years. And this year, if you look closely, the international steel workers flipped and are now pushing worker ownership and worker co-ops on the Mondragon model. I'm a historian. I take those kinds of processes that begin with, it can't be done here in Youngstown? What are you, crazy? And building slowly in the state, the, and it's ideas as well as experience, away from non-participation, in an era where problems don't get solved. Ohio has been living like the United States of America for the last 30 years, industrial decay. The whole state, I'm exaggerating, but what you're seeing in the country has been going on in Ohio for a long time. And there you're seeing a process coming out of ideas, activists, inspiration, and then people begin to participate. And they begin to learn. And the Cleveland is only one step on that model, and now the unions are flipped. So that may give you some vague sense of the process of what I sometimes call evolutionary reconstruction. It's not reform. Reform leaves the structures in place. They get, they get, they get to own the capital, and you try to fix it up around the edges. It's not revolution that collapses and there's a change, but it's an evolving process of transformation, something like what I've said, but when it gets political, probably much more powerful. But that's a kind of illustration of how I think participation is not the norm. People have to learn it and be inspired. He asked, would I care to venture a guess as to the year we will have single-payer uh, single health care? I think it's 1927. <laughs> I mean, 2027. I have no idea. I, but I think we're in the range of the next two decades. And I'm not arguing that simply because we want that. I'm saying that the internal pressures are ex extreme and that pieces of the puzzle are falling apart before your eyes. And state by state, there's a movement because of the, pressure, the pressures. So the question is, he was asking about Mondragon, which is the bat. Do you all, everybody know what Mondragon is? Great. I'll, I'll give you a short version on it for people who don't know. And also the, Germ that's, these are, and the German co-determination system, which also blocks outsourcing. And is any of that useful here? Blocking outsourcing is, is useful here. Uh, I'm less excited about uh, co-determination, the putting people on the boards. 
Uh, I think it's a step, but, uh, and I'll, I'm gonna save it, I'll tell you this, the same problem with that as the problem that's emerging with the Mondragon. So Mondragon, for those of you who don't know, how many people don't know? Okay, Mondragon is in the Basque country of Spain, very interesting, probably the most interesting experiment of this kind, and also tells you what can be done by serious people. 50 years, roughly, 50 years ago, started by a Catholic priest in the Basque region of Spain um, to get jobs for young people who didn't have jobs. They set up a technical college, a little technical college. They began training young engineers, and they began setting up a, comp a, a competent uh, worker co-op structure. But they began to, they were very, they did do their homework. They have now 85,000 people in one of the largest high-tech and many, many sector uh, co-op that is very efficient and highly, uh, in many, many, many sectors, all organized. So if one of, the, one of the sectors goes down, people get a job in the other one. And there's an internal revolving fund. And it's a very interesting. It's very participatory, but it's also high-tech and high research. They're right at the cutting edge of research in each industry that they're involved in. So it's, not a, it's, a like a, it's a like a very large corporation, but it's totally worker-owned and worker-controlled. Very, very interesting model. A lot of people are getting a lot of attention with it. Uh, and many people, Mondragon's here. They want to build here as well. Uh, I have a few problems with Mondragon. First, I think it, uh, and let me, riff, let me say this carefully, I think it is the most exciting thing that's been done around the world. And it, I think it has problems. The most important problem is the same problem that you have with co-determination. Mondragon is running into trouble because it's up against the world market. It's in a market-based global system, and it's being hit by the Chinese and the Eastern Europeans as beginning to undercut it, as any market system does. Same with the co-determination structure. Corporate capitalist systems in a market must either grow and compete or get beaten down. And Mondragon's facing that right now. So I gave you that model in Cleveland and the larger scale possibility of using illust illustratively mass transit and rail as partial stabilizers of the market. That's a different model. Mondragon is not a system changing model. It is a really exciting co-op. But it is not interested in changing the system. It's interested in jobs for Basque people. It's a very different question. So if you want to think through the system problem rather than one of the institutions, that you've got to do both. You've got to ask how do you stabilize the market to prevent the problems that are well known with markets. So let me, let me draw you out on this just a little bit so, you know, and again, make me sit down because I'm in totally into this stuff. I'll go on for it all night if you don't <laughs> pull me down. It, the problem becomes how do you gain sufficient stability and use the market as a corrective so you don't get the well-known problems of bureaucracy. So you use some small business competing, but you also stabilize so you don't have the drive to grow. Businesses, including significant scale co-ops like Mondragon, in a market must compete or they get killed. And if there are technical issues involved, they've got to grow, not so much out of greed, though there's plenty of greed, but if they don't grow, someone will kill the market and they're dead. So all the problems with growth that are associated with the dynamics of market change are built into really serious scale co-ops as well, unless there's a planning system that takes it from a project to a systemic design. And none of the, neither of the models you're talking about is interested in systemic design. They're interested in those institutions, and both of them are pluses. And there's a still another problem that we need to face. And Cleveland gives you one idea about it. He asked if, if there are any models that I could give you that, that have done the kind of organizing that might do it, and particularly the transition town movement. Uh, I, don't have a, I don't have anybody who's done the whole, the whole ball of wax. There are lots of people doing pieces of it. I am less enamored of the transition movement, except that it opens up a vision, but I don't think it deals with systems and large-scale planning problems and it's project, it's, here's a dirty word, it's integration of projects or integrated projectism. <laughs> Do you hear that one? Uh, that's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> that is to say, I'm against projectism. I l think projects are critical. You've got to do projects. But people get into their project and make it projectism. This is the thing. And you're facing a systemic crisis, honey. Projects are part of the puzzle, and we need to beyond, go beyond that. See, there, there are four really interesting models that have happened around the world that, take, that are advancing the ball. One is Mondragon, the most interesting one. The Emilia Romano section of, of, the, of Italy. Complex history of many small businesses and many small cooperatives working together and marketing together and using the state 
to help with marketing and to help with technical assistance and research. Now that's really an interesting model. It is a capitalist mar marketplace model, but it uses the state very actively. Now, really interesting question. This is where you get into the, the weeds again. Both Ramondragon and Emilia Romana, the two really hot examples that people cite, are not explainable without the prehistory of fascism. Those, the Basque country was brutalized by Franco and the culture that was built that allowed this, that plus Catholicism allowed the development. Mussolini clobbered the communists in the Emilia Romana region and built a whole new culture that was able to generate that. So there, those models historically, the historical dynamics that led to them may or may not apply to our situation. And they are essentially in a capitalist market model. They aren't pl state planned, although they use the state. Complex model, really interesting. The fourth one, by the way, Cl Cleveland is the third one, which I think is the most interesting for the reasons I've said. And the fourth one is a Japanese model called Sekatsu. It's a million person co-op. Very interesting. Starting at the market, they organized the market first, neighborhood by neighborhood by neighborhood, and then went backed into production. So that's another one. So there's some very large scale stuff going on. She was talking about a pharmacy in which a, I think a Vietnamese man who runs it and, and the customers were loyal because they were loyal to the way he did things, I gather. And why, but may go out of business because they will die off. Is it possible to build a culture that would not be looking just for the lowest price? That's what she's saying. And I don't know the answer to that. I think we'll have to test how far people are willing to go and press that culture forward. And that's one of the avenues of, there may, be, there may, actually, may actually be some evidence on that. I just don't know. So the question is, uh, I had said that I'd, given the pain levels, I would support lots of programs like Obama. I'd rather have Obama than the dangers that come. And it doesn't, don't we need to instead kind of not legitimate that and build a new politics? I think that's roughly what he said, but maybe I've gotten it wrong. Uh, I do think we need to build a new politics. I think we build, need to build a very big participatory politics. And I think the blocking function, preventing, the, preventing fascism by stabilizing as much as possible is really important. And, and secondly, a lot of people are in a lot of pain. I don't think we're gonna get very far that way until we, re, until we re alter the institutional base of the next politics, which is what I've been talking about all the evening. How do you build the, the politics is about the institutional capacities that undergird the political capacities and movements. People want to build a new movement, I'm for that. But when you're talking about systemic issues, how do we get the institutional base to change as part of that process rather than separate from it? So I'm not worried about the problem you're worried about. I don't think we're gonna do much more than reduce the pain levels by the traditional politics, and that's very important. There are a lot of people in a lot of pain. She's asking about particularly public sector and unions. And, and how do we both use, what, what is my view of them and how do we build democracy in them? And so I will take as much as we can get. I think it's very important, given the state, for all the reasons I've sketched, to stabilize the system and to build democracy in the institutions that exist, like, like some of the unions. And some of them are very interesting in this respect and could be more interesting. The second thing she asked was, we're on a defensive fight in most parts of the country. We're trying to prevent the worst rather than try to advance a new vision. And that's true. I'm from Wisconsin, right? We, I, we know about that. So um, on the other hand, and then I think the defensive fight has to be fought for the reasons I've said. But I don't think we're going to be able to advance the ball in most parts of the country until we build a whole new institutional base for politics as well as a new politics. Not just a movement. Movement's critical but in movement with institutional capacities that advance the ball in, 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 uh, institutionally. The other thing I would say about this, uh, and this is a probably, this is a one thing that people haven't been thinking about. Uh, I call it the checkerboard strategy. In some states, it's going down the tubes fast, but in some states, there are openings. And I think as those really painful ones go down, some of them are gonna advance and, and we can begin to show models that actually work, cities and states checkerboard and moving around the places where you can do more than a defensive strategy, beginning to show a real solution. Uh, as I said, in many cities, for instance, here's, let me give you another solution to this. That is, in the, I wish the press covers this, but they don't. Um, land development is critical to most city development. That's what real estate's all about. Who, d who gets to control the land development? Now, 35 years ago, the notion of a land trust was weird. How many people know what a land trust is? Okay, it's essentially, it's a, either a neighborhood-owned nonprofit ownership of land and socializing it, 
or a city ownership of land socializing it. You didn't see any of those in, 19, in the 1970s. There were two that existed, one in Georgia by Sher the, the Sherrods, Sher Sherrods in southern Georgia did a big land trust, a small-scale land trust, and the other one was in Vermont. And they socialized the land, captured the land increases that happened in development for some part of the, usually for housing or for the city, rather than for the developer. It's a mini socialist structure, structure using the nonprofit land trust or the city owned land trust. That's happening all over the country now because there's no other solution. Irvine is doing 5,000 units of housing under land trust. Chicago's doing 100,000, uh, a million, a thousand units. Washington's doing 1,000 units. There are two or 300 of them because there's no available answer other than that. There's no money for housing, but if you capture the land and socialize it in mini socialist land trust, you can capture, you can prevent the gentrification, you can capture some of the gains, turn some of the gains into support for housing. So there is a checkerboard phenomenon, but I totally agree there's a lot of defensive fights that have to be fought, and yet there's also some other battles where we can advance the ball. But a, a very important point here, and this is what's happening also around the country. Co-ops, worker-owned companies, land trusts, et cetera, these are businesses. They're different structured businesses. The American business community has done a hell of a good job getting all kinds of benefits for itself out of government. City government, state government, federal government. These businesses can use exactly the same things. Tax benefits, loans, technical assistance. They are using them. It's a very big deal. Adam Smith is dead. The American business community in any city is using the city for tax, loans, technical assistance, funding, etc. Investments. Most cities in the country now directly invest by the city in private businesses through one or another corporation. That's very conventional. They could be doing that for other firms. It's, people don't know that this has happened. That's the trend. So you can use these tools if you organize and get the right folks on the council. And the mayor looks good if you do it right. So, you know, you can move to a different level. She said, would investment in public, in, uh, public infrastructure also do? That would be a way, a traditional way to do more jobs, which I'm for. It's a Keynesian way of, of doing it now but it doesn't change the structure of ownership and control that we're talking about in this discussion. So I'm, I'm not against that, of course. The uh, hardest thing I want to, the, the, the hardest thing I want to give you, this is really heavy, so I'm going to give you a, 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 a question to ask yourself. And I, my experience is it's the hardest thing for anybody to do and far harder than anything I've said so far. So the question to ask yourself tomorrow when you look at the mirror is, Am I willing to spend one hour a week doing anything different this week or next week than I did last week in connection with the system question? Very heavy. Very heavy. You got it? All right, so that's the second. And the second thing is, I think that I still, I still uh, you know, I'm, I'm an old 60s person. You know, I, I, I still have a lot of kind of great memories of the, the women's movement. That is, Chairman Mao said, revolutions come out of the barrel of a gun. And the women's movement said, no, 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 no. They come out of six women getting together over coffee and reading and talking and supporting each other and doing something. Six people in a room reading a book, then figuring out the next project and supporting each other. That's power. And that's how you build power. Killing people for vanity, stop killing people for vanity. Yo, it's gonna be.